So for, for me to show up that way and then to invite other members of this church to show up that way is still scary. And yet it's like scarier for me to just not do that. This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. Are you waiting for permission? Are you giving yourself permission to create the business you really want to run? Are you giving yourself permission to work in the ways you want to work? My guest today made a move that opened the floodgates and helped her give herself permission to get more creative, more honest, and more courageous in her work. That move was expanding from only having a therapy practice into also having a coaching business. As you're listening, ask yourself what you're longing to give yourself permission to step into. And I encourage you to take that longing seriously. My guest today is Caitlin Olson, a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as a coach. Caitlin is also working on a mental health memoir while building her online course library. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Annie. So I want to talk to you all about your transition into coaching and what it's like, what it's been like for you being a therapist and then adding coaching to your business in really a pretty big way. Let's jump in by hearing about who you work with in your coaching business. Sure. So in my coaching business, it's almost exclusively women, adult women who are looking to build some sort of strong foundation in terms of self-care or their relationship with themselves. Often they're navigating some big transitions, maybe the end of a marriage or some sort of faith crisis transition or um, their kids are growing up and they don't know what to do with themselves, you know, so it's a little bit of crisis, but it's, it's very much building something that maybe they used to have and lost track of, or just have really craved in terms of that relationship with themselves. And then the, the coaching piece that I love the most is when we're in daily contact and accountability really comes into play. And that's really fun. So a lot of clients really don't have that in their lives, that kind of somebody who's really asking them how they're doing every day and how they're taking care of themselves and where their thoughts and feelings are. And so to build that habit of reflection and introspection is really fun to just watch unfold. Okay. How do you do the daily contact? I use Marco Polo. It's it feels kind of silly. It's not a professional app, but it's a really great way. It takes the relationship to a whole new level. And because I work all online and I get to see them in their own homes during session and then in this in these videos, and you know, maybe in the car or just out and about in their daily lives, it just gives me such a clearer picture of how they really are doing and and how they're, mental health is affected day to day. So I really love it. Well, I mean, a lot of top tier coaches use Marco Polo. Like it's just such a great, it's just such a great tool for getting to work asynchronistically, like where you get to get their question. I mean, I'm not telling you this, Caitlin, you know, this is what you do every day, but like you get their question, you get their request for feedback, their check-in, and then you get to respond, but not in that moment. I mean, I, you know, I work this way in my coaching and with Loom in my case, and it has just blown things open in terms of how available I can be to people, how much transformation happens. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think, and this speaks to the general kind of switch or expansion from strictly therapy into coaching is that therapy, at least the way I was, I was taught to do it and, you know, learned about it is that it's very professional. It's very formal. It's very regulated. And coaching is, you know, it's the wild west. There isn't any regulation and there, there are programs certainly to train you how to be a coach, but not in the academic world. So 
to use Marco Polo as a therapist feels like breaking rules, right? It feels like kind of doing something we're not supposed to do. I remember rejecting Facebook friend requests from past clients early in my career because I was told not to be Facebook friends with clients, right? And now I'm Marco Poloing with them. It really does break down the barriers that felt, I don't know, felt necessary, but also can get in the way with certain clients. How did you know, what what told you that you wanted to expand into coaching? I was turning down a lot of business and I didn't want to say no to people who were asking me for therapeutic services simply because they didn't live in Nevada, which was the only state that I was licensed. So I had a friend from grad school who, like me, you know, was trained as a marriage and family therapist and licensed. And I told him how these all these people, it felt like so many people were coming to me via social media or a friend of a friend or family recommendation. And I was having to turn them away. And I didn't have good recommendations to send them to in their local area and feeling like, you know, I wanted to be able to do more. And he just, from a business perspective, he said, stop saying no to all this business, you know, but we need to figure out a way. And he was had already started doing that, you know, and moving into coaching. And so that just kind of gave me an idea and permission at the same time, you know, and then I started taking it, taking it on and created new paperwork and have been clear with clients about what I can and can't do. And I emailed I think it's the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, AAMFT, and asked their legal department, you know, for some guidance. And they said, as long as I'm not diagnosing or really directly treating mental illness, I can do both. And I can I can offer coaching services outside of my state of licensure. So <laughs> I'm a rule follower and having that permission really let me go, you know, set me free to do this. What surprised you the most as you stepped more and more into coaching? I guess just how little difference there is between therapy and coaching. I kind of thought I had to be in like a different mode. And at the beginning, I structured my notes differently because it felt like they had to be separate. Like they must be very different. And I don't know. I think it's, I you know, the way I make sense of that is that I think I was doing a lot of coaching in my therapist work already. And of course, still bring therapeutic skills and interventions into my coaching work. But it did, it surprised me how natural it felt. And I guess how much I had learned as a therapist in terms of how to be a good coach too. Coaching is a lot like cognitive behavioral therapy, at least the way I kind of see it. And then, of course, it's not technically the same, but there's a lot of overlap and, and uh, structural therapy, strategic therapy, you know, all of those different modalities feel coachy to me now that I'm on both sides of it. When you're working as a coach, you have both one-on-one work, one-on-one coaching, and you also have some other offers. Can you kind of break down for us what your different offers are? Sure. Yeah. So I have one-on-one And sometimes I'll work with a coaching client and all we do is meet weekly or even every other week. And it's, that's kind of the lowest contact. And then I have the coaching packages where I do daily contact on top of weekly sessions. So those are the two one-on-one modalities right now for coaching. And then I have a few courses, one of which includes a Facebook kind of support and coaching group that I go in there once a week and offer answers to questions or just kind of guidance on the topic. It's a boundaries for beginners coach. So I just talk, speak to boundaries. And then I have the true self-care toolbox, which is an audio course. And that's really hands-off. So something that anyone can buy and listen to at their own pace. And I'm working on, gosh, (laughs) <laughs> three more courses hoping to launch by June. We'll see. But the the goal is to continue to build this course library. And then for coaching small groups, that's another thing that I that I'm kind of have in the works, you know, that isn't really underway yet. But I did do a workshop last spring 
that was really fun with a small group, live meeting every week for an hour and a half. And that was all about boundaries. And that was really, really fun and something I would love to do again when the time is right. How are people finding you as a coach? Honestly, mostly, well, the social media, Instagram is where I like to hang out the most. And so people will find me there. And then I have a Psychology Today profile, so people will find me there too, but that's limited by location. So mostly therapy clients find me there because I'm uh, the, the profile is connected to where I'm licensed in Nevada. So I get a lot of people from Las Vegas looking for therapy via Psychology Today. And then I have a blog, beehiving.com, which is where a good bit of my coaching clients come from too. How do you think people find beehiving? So I think they're searching. My impression is they search for LDS therapist or betrayal trauma therapist. And if they're at Psychology Today and looking for LDS therapist, I come up. (laughs) And then Instagram, you know, who knows how many different algorithms and hashtags bring people to me. Yes. And sometimes it's, it's hard to know what the path is. It's like we've got these plans of okay, I'm going to have this like, quote unquote, funnel where people will come in over here, then they'll do this, then they'll learn that. And then, you know, if, if if I'm a good fit for what they're looking for, then they'll hire me. And then when we ask people, it's such a, it's such a more kind of unpredictable process of how people actually find you. And we have so much less control than we think. And I think Mm -hmm. that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) In just a minute, we're going to get into Caitlin's take on niching and her practices for managing her business and her children during a relocation and the pandemic. First, I wanna invite you to apply for Create Your Program. This is a five-week process to expand beyond private practice. You'll go from having an idea or even a bunch of ideas that you need to narrow down to actually launching a pilot program. This is a small group experience where you get a lot of brave work done in a supportive group of driven and open-hearted entrepreneurs. You also get a lot of attention from me. This is for you if you're a therapist or a healer and you want to expand your business. Go to rebeltherapist.me slash create to learn more about it and apply. Okay, let's get back into it with Caitlin. In your journey in the last year, what's been something with Instagram where you found yourself kind of speaking up, using your voice in a new way? You know, I started to talk more about just myself and my own opinions and my own views or beliefs. First, with my kind of body shame, my relationship with my body and around eating and food and just sharing like, I needed help with this and this is who's helping me and this is what I'm learning. And then that kind of opened some floodgates. So then I started to really talk about social justice issues and then different cultural and social issues within my religion. So I'm LDS, you know, the member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as Mormonism. And there is a lot of complication in that culture, just like with any conservative religious, you know, fill in the blank culture. And I was really kind of marketing myself as an LDS therapist and trying to be catch all like I'm not any more specific than that you know if we if you're looking for an LDS therapist I'm your gal and I can I can do that and and you can assume whatever you want about whatever that might mean about me and let your assumptions you know like exist and I won't correct you or I won't let my own views again beliefs complications within that title of LDS, I won't let that get in the way or I won't let that have space in the therapy office, if that makes sense. And so over the last year, I've let that stuff have space and take up room. And it really did start on Instagram. I don't, I don't remember like a specific, you know, decision or like a real moment, but just starting to speak to in very specific ways, my LDS followers and sharing my perspective as an LDS therapist. And 
speaking to things that are taboo in our religion or in the culture, at least, you know, that are hard to talk about. And I do remember a specific, the first time I, I posted what I call a to my LDS friends post where I, I start with to my LDS friends and then I say what I want to say. The first time I posted it, I thought it didn't feel that big of a deal. Like it felt pretty natural, I think, just because of the internal shifts that were happening for me. But it got a lot of engagement, you know, to use the Instagram term, but just a lot of support and a lot of excitement, a lot of reposts. And that's when I thought, oh, like I'm, I am onto something. And I didn't get if I, maybe I'm misremembering. I don't think I got any pushback on that first one. And then eventually I would get a lot of pushback and a lot of criticism, you know, of my, what, what sound like, or are these more kind of liberal views and, and calling for true Christianity within this, this religion rather than kind of performative or, I don't know, towing the line, you know, and so for, for me to show up that way and then to invite other members of this church to show up that way is still scary. And yet it's like scarier for me to just not do that right now. So I keep, I keep doing it. And sometimes I lose followers and sometimes <laughs> I gain. <laughs> do you feel like because you're, you're speaking out more from your point of view Do you notice that that changes who's drawn to your work? Does it end up changing who's showing up and hiring you? I think yes, yes and no, because not everybody who hires me is aware of my Instagram account or follows me or reads every post, right? So some people come to me in crisis because they've just experienced some sexual betrayal in their marriage and they just need somebody to guide them through you know, putting out fires at the beginning of that process. And they probably don't even know and likely wouldn't really care, you know, about this progressive Mormonism piece of me. And then I think I know I have some clients who I know are aware and I, and I think they're kind of choosing to set it aside and it doesn't really inform, you know, in one way or another, they're just happy to be with a therapist who understands the LDS religion and the culture and they don't have to explain everything, <laughs> you know, or defend it. Right. And then, um, but then I definitely do have clients who, for example, I had an inquiry call, right. Had a just consultation a couple weeks ago with a man who asked me a bunch of questions. And then he had a couple other interviews with other therapists before he chose one. And then he called me back and said, I want to work with you. And it's after I read some of your blog posts and saw on Instagram that you identify as a progressive Mormon and I really need that. So sometimes it is the deciding factor, but kind of like you were saying earlier with these funnels, like who knows what gets people to me really at the end of the day. Can you estimate just very roughly, like how much of your business right now is coaching as opposed to therapy? Um, I I think it's pretty close to half and half and that's, that is a really rough guess. And just based off of, you know, my clients I see this week and next week, just kind of glancing at my calendar. Um, But it is, it's pretty close to half and half right now. Do you anticipate it moving one direction or the other? I think, I mean, just looking at, at it as a numbers game, it has to go more into coaching than staying therapy because unless I get licensed in all 50 States, you know, (laughs) it's just not the odds are, are sacked against therapy staying even as high as it is now in terms of percentage of my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking, especially with your visibility of how you're, your audience is growing and growing. And as your audience grows, it's more and more people who are not local to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, in a way, you know, as I get more specific and more niched, as I kind of figure out my ideal clientele, the, the different areas or specialties in my work, 
will will narrow and narrow, but then the numbers will grow, right? Because more eyes will be be on me, but also it's just less limited to any sort of licensure or regulation. For people who are listening and they're like, wait a minute, what? Narrow your niche and then work with more people? Like, how does that work? How how do you think about that? From what I see and then what I've learned from you and other people is that the more specific I get, like if I were to say, I only work with women who are progressive Mormons, you know, if I were to say like, that's all I do, then that becomes my specialty. I become better and better at it. And it's really clear for potential clients. And if they see, I need a therapist and I'm LDS and I have some questions and, you know, I don't know who's the right fit. If they see five people and I'm the only one who says I work with LDS women who are progressive Mormons and everyone else just happens to be LDS, but they do trauma, but they also do couples, but they also do all this other stuff. It it's just draws a person in and marketing wise, that's great. Right. But also connection wise. And then if that's all I'm doing, that's all I'm thinking about. That's all I'm learning about. I get better and better and better at this specific population. Again, this specific niche and more and more success for my clients and then more and more referrals or more and more repeat customers (laughs) again, from a business perspective. So that's kind of how I'm visualizing, I guess, or kind of making sense of it now. That makes everything you said. And I'm thinking then, because you also do things with groups, then they get to be with each other when they're working with you. Yeah, that's the next small group that I have my eye on is women who have, and maybe men too, this is where I start to get, you know, loosey goosey around it and uncertain, but people, let's just say people who have done a coaching package with me. And so they're really familiar with the daily introspection and the accountability and the pacing. And they're really committed to their mental wellness and connection. I want them to not rely on just me. You know, I want them to learn how to rely on other people in their lives. And so creating a small group ex- exclusively for people who have gone through a coaching package with me and that I would still be a part of, but can foster these connections outside of just me. And I love small groups. I, m- I miss doing groups. You know, I just, like I mentioned, just recently stopped running a few groups. And the magic of it is that you get to help nurture these friendships. They're not therapeutic bonds. You know, they're real friendships that, that you can launch well, you know, beyond and eventually they forget about me, which is the point, And they get to have each other, you know, and it's really, that's really cool. So that is the next small group thing that I'll get figured out. Anything else that you're really excited about creating and building? Yeah. So I, I have ideas all the time and it's, it's like a blessing and a curse, right? But the thing that I'm more, most focused on this year is getting my book proposal done and accepted somewhere. And I, you know, that's as specific as I can be right now, but writing has always been really fun for me. I was an English major. I love reading and I've just been really excited about creating something, you know, in that genre. And I, I took a a creative nonfiction workshop at UNLV about a year year and a half ago. And it was so fun. just lit that fire. So I've been writing ever since and getting it into a proposal and nurturing that kind of creativity in a different way. And um, so that's really exciting. And then I, I do, I love small groups. I love creating courses. I love the one-on-one work. So doing all of that this year, but the book is, this is the first year that I've really taking it seriously, you know, and that's really exciting for me. It feels like your expansion into coaching has kind of opened up a lot of possibilities. Yes. Yeah. Again, permission, you know, that Mm -hmm. the floodgates were opened in how I show up on Instagram and how I show up professionally, what kind of services I offer. And then what I give myself permission to do being a writer 
felt like it was something I had to go back to school for, you know, or start small with and save this big book project for when I'm established or something like that. And to just have permission to do everything I want to do feels so much better. I know that you, like me, are a parent and, you know, a parent in 2020 and 2021. Mm Mm-hmm. How do you spend a typical day, including anything that you're finding really helps you to get focused? We moved from Nevada to California last summer and in the middle of a pandemic, right? And kids kind of in school, but not really. And so we've had those two big forces, right? Relocating and then being home much more, giving us a lot of good reasons to figure out some structure in the day's that are more internally driven than externally. So I am typically on a work day, Monday, I work at least a little bit Monday through Friday, but Monday, Wednesday, Thursday are my full work days. And I'll get up and be with the kids and my husband a little bit, but he's kind of the the go-to parent on those days, right? So he's the front lines (laughs) and I'm like the last resort when it comes to the kids. But to get me like into work mode, I need at least an hour to do my own anything. And that usually looks like some reading, some writing, some meditation, and some movement. And sometimes it's more like two hours, but it just kind of depends on the timing of the day. And then I tell my kids goodbye. I say, I'm going to work. And then I go into the office with two or three beverages, you know, and a snack. And I don't come out for a few hours. And when I do, it's for 30 minutes, maybe, maybe 45, to eat lunch and say hello and and ask them how school is going. And then I go back into the office, say I'm going to work. And being able to say I'm going to work and locking the door and having the do not disturb sign on the door has made a big difference. And sometimes, because my children are young, my youngest is four, sometimes she'll be four and knock on the door or interrupt a session It doesn't happen very often, but it happens. And just, you know, reminding them about those boundaries and setting up rewards. But it really, even for myself to say, I'm going to work now. I'm not a parent right now. That's not my primary role in in this couple hour chunk of my day has made a big difference. And then when at the end of the day, I come out and sometimes I'll play that Shania Twain song where it's like, honey, I'm home and I've had a long day. <laughs> Pour me a cold one. <laughs> I won't sing anymore, but we'll put that on Alexa. And that's the signal. Okay, mom's home. You know, mom's here. And I'm not in work mode anymore. Oh my God, I love that. It's fun. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for this. Oh, thank you, Annie. Me too. It's been so fun. Thanks so much. Now I'm going to highlight a few key takeaways from that conversation. Number one, in her one-on-one coaching, daily contact using Marco Polo has helped Caitlin serve people more effectively, both in terms of understanding their daily lives and offering accountability. It just gives me such a clearer picture of how they really are doing and and how their mental health is affected day to day. So I really love it. Number two, Posting to her LDS community about her personal and sometimes controversial opinions has helped her grow engagement and bring in right fit people. It got a lot of engagement, you know, to use the Instagram term, but just a lot of support and a lot of excitement, a lot of reposts. Number three, she sees niching as an engine for her exponential growth. She knows she'll continue to draw more people as she narrows her niche and that her ability to help folks in that niche will continue to increase. That's all I'm thinking about. That's all I'm learning about. I get better and better and better at this specific population. Again, this specific niche. And those are the takeaways I wanted to leave burning in your brain before we say goodbye. You can find out more about Caitlin at beehiving.com. That's B-E-H-I-V-I-N-G.com. I want to thank Cosmo Palms for editing this podcast. If you found this episode supportive, please share it with your favorite therapist or healer. That's how we grow this rebel community. And thank you so much for listening. I will see you next time with another inspiring guest.